author of this wonderful paper, it's elaborate research four years of work, and it come out with what your talk and uh, your, your paper is titled a little differently, but the talk really is was about private versus government, new evidence of school performance and implications, which is a point about the bar, implications for India's right to education act. What were you really hoping to achieve with this extensive research? So we were trying to answer two fundamental questions. And the first fundamental research question is, are private schools in India less or more effective than government schools on average? Now, the reason this is such a difficult question to answer is, if you take any national survey on academic outcomes and compare public versus private schools, the private schools will do better. But the problem is that the children who go to private schools also come from households that are wealthy, you know, where the parents are more educated. So if you look at the difference, it's impossible to tell if this difference is because the school is more effective or because it is selecting more affluent and educated parents. So from a policy perspective, it becomes a really important question because what RTD Clause 12 is going to be doing is it's effectively mandating reservation of places in these private schools with the government reimbursing those fees. And we have no idea whether these private schools are in fact more or less effective. So it's really worth your money. Exactly, right? So the, what the research design in the question is doing it's doing the first large scale randomized experiment, which is considered the gold standard in social science research. And so, what we're doing is to make sure we are isolating the effect of just the type of school we go to, we're taking a universe of children who start at the government school, and then we offer a scholarship that allows some of them to move to a private school. But the key is that the scholarship is offered by a lottery. Right? So, because of the lottery, on average, the winners and the losers have exactly the same SEC and household characteristics. And then we track these children over four years. And the only difference is going to be that the lottery winners went to the private school and the others were controlled. So this is kind of the language of a clinical trial where you have treatment and a control. So it's important to spend this time with the design because this is the first large-scale experimental study of this kind in any low-income setting. And so yeah, that's kind of what makes the study so exciting. Now what do we find? So the main and very important kind of interesting design is that the private schools, so there are two sets of results. First is on the process. Yeah, they say they're more productive but less effective. Is there not a contribution in those two words? <laughs> so it's useful to kind of just understand what exactly the private schools are doing differently. See, overall what happens is the private schools, they hire teachers who are much less qualified, who are younger, okay, and they pay them much, much less on average than the government schools. But the private school management tends to be much better. So the teachers have much lower absence, much higher time on task. They also hire more teachers, so they have lower PTRs, lower multi-grade teaching. So the composite effect appears to offset each other. And what you find in terms of learning outcomes is after four years, the private school kids don't, the kids who move to private school, don't do better on maths and telco. But this is where it gets a little nuanced, right? So this would seem like the private school is not more effective because even after four years, maybe the difference is all because of household. Because when I take these poor kids and move them to a private school, there's no difference in maths and level. But what happens is the private school, in fact, spends a lot less time teaching these subjects. Right? They spend 40% less time in Telugu, about 30% less time on maths. And they're taking the extra time in teaching more English, more science, social studies, and Hindi. So when you test across all these subjects, you find that the private school children do slightly better. But from an economics perspective, what is really important to keep in mind is that the private school's cost per student is dramatically lower, that the average cost in the private school is only about one third the cost of the government school. So to synthesize the result, you see that the private schools are slightly more effective, but at a much lower cost per student. And that's why I say they're not much more effective, but much more productive, because they deliver slightly better outcomes, but at much lower cost. So in the process, if you follow it to its logical conclusion, if the private school is marginally more productive, if not effective, whatever the nuance thing may be, at the same time they're much more cost effective, then logically that we're making, one is making a case for the disappearance completely of the government sector from primary school. 6 to 14 is what the RTA each group is. So if you have a two alternatives, one of which is more productive and more cost effective, vis-a-vis -vis the other, then there is really no case for the other. So does it logically follow from this that the private sector entirely should take the space and government should completely, you know, vacate the space for the private sector? You assume all over the world, primary healthcare, primary education is where governments play a big role. Well, that's a good question. So where do tax their money? Okay. Whereas this seems to suggest that the government should completely abdicate. What is your response to that? So I think, you know, so the, the answer is a lot more nuanced than that. Right? And I think the important thing to keep in mind is the results I have given you are averages, right? But the averages hide an enormous amount of variation. 
right? So there is huge variation in government schools and there's huge variation in private schools. So 60, only 60% of the parents who got the scholarship actually took it. Yeah, yeah 40% why, were why, happy to stay in the government Why is that so? Because, because they, private was better, parents would wish a better outcome. Because right? private is better on average. That does not mean every private is better. So if you're in a village where the government school is doing better, okay. you stay in the government school. Okay. So the larger point is, I don't want to make this an ideological issue about public versus private. Mm -hmm. Rather, I want to make this an issue about choice and empowerment. Okay. Right? Because today what happens is, if you have the ability to pay, mm -hmm. you have the option of going to a private school. And, but if the government school is good, you can stay there. But if you're poor and don't have the ability to pay, you effectively are stuck with the government school. So in cases where the government school is not good, then you won't have an option. So what the research and what the parental responses suggest, so there's two very important things. First is that people are not uniformly picking private or government. Right? They're very nuanced about this. So which then gets me to the second point, which is, is the implication of this that the government sector should disappear? Absolutely not. Because the only thing worse than a public monopoly is a private monopoly. So you definitely don't want the government to advocate in the space. But what you want is both the public and the private sector to exist, to discipline each other in terms of effectiveness, and you provide you want to provide people with a choice. So it would be consistent with the philosophy of saying fund the student and not the school, and let the money go to whichever school the student chooses to go to. So if the public sector is able to improve its effectiveness, then the private sector will shut down and vice versa. Since the ultimate aim of any kind of act like this is to improve the quality of a, ensure education access mm -hmm. and ensure access to quality education, is it not possible to achieve these same things by ensuring better accountability in government schools? So and I, that's, a, that's a great point, but I don't think these are mutually exclusive. Okay. See, I think we have a country of 1.2 billion, thank you, and there's just no reason, there's no silver bullet. Right? Education is such a complex subject. It's the social issues, the political issues, the management issues, the cultural issues. So I think we just want to try everything we can, and these are not mutually exclusive. So I think the RTE does call for strengthening of school management committees. I mean, there's certainly a case for increasing the fraction of kind of monitoring and inspections. In fact, we found another study that you know just increasing the amount of administrative monitoring has a very strong effect in reducing teacher absence. So I think you could invest in governance in parallel with this. So there are multiple channels of accountability. In fact, it's very useful to think about Albert Hirschman's framework, right? I mean, of exit and voice. So if as a customer you're unhappy with the product, I mean, you have two channels of exhibiting your feedback. The first is you use voice. You call customer service and say, I'm really unhappy. The second is you say, you know what, I'm just going to the competition, and that is exit, right? Now, what happens is accountability in market spaces works mostly through the threat of exit. Whereas accountability in political spaces works mostly through voice because you don't leave your country if you're unhappy. You vote, you do dharnas, you you know, you kind of exercise voice. What's interesting about schooling is schooling is kind of a nice hybrid of kind of market and state spaces right? because there's collective action, so you can use certain rights that you have to try and improve your government school. But if for some reason it's not responding, then what this is giving you is it's giving you an option to also have the exit. So the hope is that you're trying every option to improve the overall accountability. But is, in the process, what we're trying to really do is, you know, some taxpayer money, as it were, is going to the private schooling system because the mm -hmm. government schooling system is not able to fulfill its obligations the way we want it to. Mm -hmm. But couldn't the same thing be done if we ensure the kind of private management that we have, mm -hmm. if we could transpose, here we're transposing, you know, taxpayer money to the private system, mm -hmm. if we could transpose private management to public schools, can we not, I think in Bombay, etc., experiments have been carried out, <coughs> where the government school is, as it were, hired out to private management. Wouldn't that be a good option to achieve the same purpose? Okay, I mean, so in some sense, these are just continuum of exactly the same thing, right? Like, you see, the larger principle here is that I think even everybody, I think regardless of whether you're a proponent of private or public schools, everybody accepts that the government has a responsibility to ensure universal education and that the government has an obligation to ensure that poverty or lack of purchasing power is not a barrier. I think where the jury is out is does the government have to be in the business of actually producing the schooling I mean, or can the production I mean, take place through a private entity. So I think all of these models that you suggest are not mutually exclusive. So, so whether here where the government provides infrastructure, where the running is done by exactly. the So yeah, there are multiple models, right? So there are models of charter schools, like I mean, which I think is worth yeah. experimenting with, where essentially you're still operating under a public charter with a certain amount of regulation, but you have a lot more autonomy in terms of how you actually manage the school. And the key dimension of school accountability really is just teacher personnel management. 
<clears throat> so what happens in the status quo in the government system is accountability for non-performance is essentially non-existent. So we've also measured management practices in these public and private schools, and it turns out that the single biggest lever of better management in the private sector is personnel policies. I mean, everything else is comparable, but it's the personnel policy where you see a little bit of difference. You know, one of the biggest problems happening in the Indian context is that even though you tell the private school that we will reimburse you, you know how tardy government is, but it actually comes to reimbursements, which is why, just like in the case of the Food Security Act, nobody argues about it. it's a very nobody says that Indian should go army. So yes, we need food security. But you're putting it through a completely leaky PDS, the same delivery system. So here again we run up against the same roadblocks because you tell the private managers we'll reimburse you. And I am having worked with government for so many years, you know the money never comes unless you pay a bribe to all the guys along the route to get your reimbursement. So what is the way out over there? So given all these, just as you said, the political economy makes it very difficult to improve our schools. Doesn't the political economy also make it very difficult for private schools to get reimbursement? Absolutely. I mean, I couldn't agree more, right? So in some sense, the, the main implication of our study is, see, what our study does is it says if we were to implement the RTE Clause 12 provision well, okay, what would happen? Because the project was implemented by the Azim Premji Foundation, okay. and then so an organization of unimpeachable integrity as part of an MOU with the government. So there was a legitimacy for the foundation to be implementing this. It's a very strong MOU. And, you know, it was, it showed, and in fact, you hear all these horror stories in Delhi about how private schools try to have implicit barriers to weaker kids and try to make sure they don't get the forms and stuff like that. You know, the good news here, you know, from a social inclusion perspective, is that the private schools were delighted to participate. We never had cases where private because schools they were sure they because they trusted the Azim Premji Foundation yeah. that we get paid the money was supposed to be paid. So the moral of the story is that RTE Clause 12 is truly one of these game-changing opportunities for the Indian education system that allows you to both reduce socio-economic stratification and improve the average productivity of the education sector. See, the important point is the private schools are achieving slightly better outcomes, but at one part the cost. cost yeah. So the real question is how much further could you improve quality if you had private management that the same amount of per child spending that the government is spending in the public system. So one of my hopes is that if you have our DE clause 12 in steady state providing a funding stream that this will create entrepreneurs that can lead to low cost innovation and effective innovation to improve quality in the education system. Because the, let's not forget that even though the public system, private schools are doing slightly better, the absolute quality is still very, very low. So it's only one step ahead of kind of a non-functional public system because it only needs to be one step ahead to be compared. So that's so the fact that the private is better is not going to solve our fundamental crisis of learning. And so the so but what's exciting about RT clause 12 is that it's a game changer both in terms of reducing social economic stratification and in terms of reducing innovation on the low cost quality side. Okay. Now the main policy recommendation that we have is that implementing this in a transparent, straightforward way is extremely important. So the good news is that, I mean, I spent three hours at MHRD yesterday, I mean, and then three hours in the public lecture yesterday, and I will be working on certain implementation frameworks for this. And one very simple point is that, and in fact, I had an exchange with Mr. Nilakani where he assures me that issuing unique IDs to school children is not a problem, and you would have effectively a system that tracks which school a child is enrolled in and have an automatic monthly transfer system is what I would like to put in place. Okay, anyway, great to have you that party. But I think you get the real meaning is if implemented properly. Unfortunately, India, that has a very big caveat, so we have to battle that. If implemented well, I entirely agree with you, it could. But my doubts always remain how do we implement these things well? So, and in fact, what I've done is I've just been trying to come and try to see that it's been So, in fact, this morning, I'm having breakfast with tea. I think we have too many policy organizations and too few implementation organizations. So a recent Harvard graduate who worked with me on this project, he has come back and set up essentially an implementation NGO that is focused, in, focused just on implementing Clause 12 properly in Delhi. So they're going to start with Delhi, and if they can do this properly, then we're hoping we can use that learning to then scale up more effectively.